it is almost unbelievable because Ferrari's big focus over the winter was reliability. To have this right off the bat, a DNF, and then now a 10 place grid penalty, like I just can't imagine where he is mentally. It's it's nuts, I can't believe that this is kind of the storyline going into the year, because especially with Red Bull being so far ahead as well, mm. this just feels like an added kick to the gut, doesn't it? We're back on Unlapped, getting ready for the Saudi Arabian Grand Prix. And as always, we have some big news to discuss on multiple fronts. Katie George, Nate Saunders, and Lawrence Edmondson, who, as it appears, is already in Jeddah. How's it going, Lawrence? Yeah, I'd like to say that I'm fresh off the plane, but I don't really feel that fresh. I've just done about 14 hours via Dubai and landed in uh, Jeddah, which is an unusual place, to say the least. Uh, it's, you know, it's, it's quite a... A different place that we visit a lot along on the calendar so um yeah uh, tomorrow we'll get stuck into going to the track talking to drivers um talking about all the stuff we're about to discuss now we'll get more information on uh so yeah ready for another race weekend number two of 23. Nate is at home in London do you do you itch to be at the track or do you like sometimes catching some R&R &R and covering the race from afar? Yeah, sometimes I like the R&R. &R. I mean, to be honest, Saudi kind of is fascinating because it's just, you know, it's a new race on the calendar. You know, there's all that controversy mm -hmm. around it. But this one's not one I'm, you know, massively itching to be at, I'll be honest. When Lawrence flies off to Australia in a couple of weeks, that's one I get major FOMO <laughs> about because, um, you know, that's just such a great venue, great place. But yeah, this one is quite a nice weekend to be back home. Yeah, fair enough. Fair enough. Well, let's dive right in because I plan on starting this week's pod with some Mercedes news, and then obviously it's ever-changing and ever-evolving. We'll start with Ferrari. Charles Leclerc will take a 10-place grid penalty in this weekend's Saudi Arabian Grand Prix after needing a third set of control electronics. And this is the second race of the season, just in case that slipped anyone's mind. <laughs> Uh, are we surprised? Was this expected, Lawrence? What does this mean for Ferrari as you go into the weekend? Well, we knew ahead of the Bahrain race that they'd already changed the energy store and the control electronics on the car, which is pretty unusual ahead of the first race. Um, to put it in perspective, they have two sets of control electronics uh, to get them through the entire season. So in an ideal world, you'd probably be changing them somewhere midway through the year. Um, uh, potentially, if you have a reliability upgrade, you might change that slightly. But it's one of those components that you just expect to last and yet mm -hmm. in uh Bahrain they managed to get through too because when Charles Leclerc uh his car retired at the side of this track it turned out that was linked to the control electronics and it is it is almost unbelievable because Ferrari's big focus over the winter was reliability and uh they had a change of management of course we had Fred Vasseur coming in as team principal in, instead of Mattia Bonotto but all the time we were talking to Fred uh at the launch of the car um at the test and ahead of the first race and you know we're saying are you sure the reliability is good you know that was a weakness you had to turn the engine down last year you lost performance is it all good this year and he kept saying everything we know all the stuff we've done on the um dyno uh, rigs back at the factory suggest it's fine and then they have this issue which they claim they haven't encountered at any point uh up to now uh twice essentially um obviously some fairly clear issue with, with, with the with the uh, components. And then you have this bizarre situation where he has a grid penalty for the second race, which I, in the whole time that we've had these grid penalties for engine changes, I don't remember that ever happening. I'm pretty sure it hasn't, uh, because usually these starts come in later in the year. And it also means realistically, look, you know, if he puts a new set in now, even if they run perfectly to their normal lifespan, he's probably still going to have a grid penalty somewhere down the line when he replaces it again later in the season. So, yeah, a real setback. And just given Ferrari's reliability issues last year, um, pretty pretty disappointing all round and, yeah, verging on unforgivable, I think. Yeah, and we were pretty stunned, weren't we, Lawrence, when in Bahrain, you know, the morning of the race, that that news that came out saying that they changed the parts. It's just so, so unusual to see. And I think for every Ferrari fan who went through a lot of pain last year, it just feels like more of the same. So pretty crazy. And, um, yeah, I think there's a few stats people trying to work out if anyone has you know the earliest people have had engine penalties um but yeah it's 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 nuts i can't believe that this is kind of the storyline going into the year because especially with red bull being so far ahead as well mm. this just feels like an added kick to the gut doesn't it um in terms of wanting the season to be close i feel like we sometimes laugh at the expense of Charles Leclerc's bad luck we certainly did a season ago and then obviously what happened in bahrain and now this 
I'll be very curious to see the sense that you get from him, Lawrence, in your conversations this weekend leading into the Grand Prix. But where do you feel like he is mentally? I mean, you try to squash what happened a season ago, all of that disappointment after so much optimism at the beginning of the season. And then you start a new fresh season, new team boss. You feel like you've worked through some of the kinks, as you mentioned. And then to have this right off the bat, a DNF, and then now a 10-place grid penalty, like I just can't imagine where he is mentally. Yeah, and especially when you see how strong Max Verstappen was in that first race, how reliably the Red Bull ran well. I mean, it was only one race, but it didn't have any issues. And then also just how dominant it looked. And, uh, you know, this was the thing going into this season was that um, Ferrari either had to well, really, they had to catch up in performance no matter what, but really they had to have the reliability there if they were going to have a sustained title challenge, which, of course, is the reason that Charles Leclerc is up Ferrari. He wants to do that with Ferrari. He's mm-hmm. made that very clear. But, yeah, to have this, you know, kick in the teeth so early on um, is is rough. Uh, I mean, if you want to try and put a positive spin on it, which maybe he'll try and do because he has no other choice, uh, you could say, well, look, get this out the way early. You know, if the performance starts to come to the car who knows what's going to happen further down the year? It's a 23 race season. You know, Max could have problems as well. So um, I guess that's the only way you can look at it. It's, it would be very devastating if you had this kind of issue at the final two races and you lost a championship that way. But um, yeah, this is me just trying to put some kind of positive <laughs> spin on it. But I, I think really it's um, it's a really tough one for him to get his head around. But then whatever choice does he have? You know, he has to go out there and try and qualify as high as possible uh, on Saturday so that he's not starting halfway down, you know, uh, the mm-hmm. bottom 10 of the grid because uh, it's, it's most likely a 10-place grid penalty. Could be, well, could, could be back of the grid if they decide to change yeah. the, the power unit as well. I thought it was interesting. The Italian press had reported that Leclerc requested a meeting with Ferrari president John Elkin uh, to discuss kind of the situation that's ongoing. And you guys know, obviously, better than I. Is it normal protocol? Does it happen often that a driver would go over the head of their team boss and meet with the president to have these kind of discussions? Because I think a lot of people are questioning what is Charles Leclerc's future at Ferrari, given, obviously, the blunders that we've seen time and time again? Yeah, I mean, it's pretty rare, isn't it, um, for a lot of the teams? Um, and if you actually look at the structure, I mean, it was interesting. We had a uh, had a media breakfast with uh, Gunther Steiner and a few other journalists mm-hmm. um, in Bahrain, and we were talking about the difference of his job compared to, say, Fred Vasseur at Ferrari. And he said, you know, for him, he talks to the drivers. He's the point man he kind of runs that team because it's such a small operation is if you look at what Mattia did or what Fred does now at Ferrari, there's, he's part of, he's one cog in this whole machine and a driver. I mean, you know, the drivers at Haas just used to continue that example would obviously speak. They'd want to know what Gene Haas is thinking, but they deal with Gunther. They'd never call up Gene Haas and say, here's, you know, here's what I think. So the fact that Charles has that relationship. And I think because there's this, sense that Charles Leclerc is the the prodigal son at Ferrari as well, isn't there? So I think that Ferrari want to keep him happy at every given juncture. Um, but yeah, if you're Mercedes, you know, Lewis Hamilton deals with Toto Wolff. He doesn't go above him to Mercedes. Uh, at Red Bull, your first point of contact is Christian Horner and Helmut Marko. Mm-hmm. You know, obviously, Dietrich Mateschitz has passed away last year, but he would kind of have a very fleeting involvement in that. You wouldn't really speak to him, you know, on a on a on, on that kind of level. So yeah, it's completely, completely unique. And um, I think the Italian press love that as well. When I remember when, when Alonso was at Ferrari and, you know, when he used to talk to Luca de Montezemolo, it would be the big, the big story heading into every race was kind of, you know, Alonso's talking to the president, what, what could he possibly want? Uh, and I think that goes back to the Schumacher days and maybe even before when, you know, Schumacher was just such a big personality. He would, you know, he wanted to talk to the, the top guy in the company, you know, when he was dealing with stuff. So um, yeah, always, always gains headlines. I'm not sure how concerned Ferrari should be about that because, you know, as we might discuss, there's not a huge amount of places that, that Charles can actually go, I don't think. Okay, to that point, you know, there's obviously always going to be rumors and speculation. We had this conversation last week with Lando Norris. If McLaren's not going to be in a position to give him the car that he needs to compete and win races, you know, how long does that relationship last? If we continue on this way, and even if Fred Visser makes changes, which it seems like he has the green light to be able to do at Ferrari, you know, if Charles Leclerc doesn't feel like there's a future here that results in championships, where would we see Charles Leclerc maybe in the future, Lawrence? Yeah, that, that's a big question. Because if you look around, you look at Red Bull, which is obviously the team that everyone wants to be at right now because they have the fastest car. Max Verstappen is tied in there for what seems like a lifetime, right? You know, he's um, <laughs> he, he, he's there uh, till at least 27. He seems very, very willing to stay there. Um, 
they're going to have a competitive car until the next change in uh, engine regulations around 2026, you'd think. Um, so why would Red Bull upset that by bringing Leclerc into, into Verstappen's team? Um, then Mercedes, well, Mercedes actually aren't in much of a better position than Ferrari right now. Um, you know, they, their race in Bahrain was pretty terrible. They, they're talking about um, a completely new car concept going forward, at least Ferrari on at that stage. And then if you want to put a positive spin on, on Leclerc's position going forward is that, you know, he's a very central part to to that team. I don't think anyone's pointing the finger and saying the drivers are the issue. And um, he also with Vasseur in place now and uh, Benedetto Vigna, who's above Vasseur, wanting to make changes uh, within the team, already making changes within the team. Uh, there's talk of uh, people leaving from the uh, design department. Now, okay, that, that could speak to uh, a lot of the, the deeper issues there, but it could also be the case that it is time to have a change and, and, and to bring in uh, new people. So um, I guess that's the way he's got to look at it. But as always in F1, there's, it's very rare that there's a short-term fix. And with this weird kind of, driver market we have at the moment where so many drives are on long-term contracts it's really hard to just jump around and, and find a competitive car um i mean fernando alonso will tell you that you know he, he <laughs> go at it he's like 2006 onwards and yeah. never quite got a championship after then so um yeah it's not it's not as easy as just being one of the best drivers on the grid and saying right i need a better car because you've got to find a way into a better car and it's not always straightforward prop bet who has a better chance at a lifetime contract max verstappen or lance stroll <laughs> I think Lance Stroll. Just about. It's close though. Uh yeah. I'd say Stroll. Um, Lawrence, you said it's hard to have a short-term fix in Formula One. And I think that that's uh an interesting way to phrase it when you're looking at what's going on at Mercedes. And there was ominous quotes, as we know from Bahrain, immediately after the Grand Prix, Lewis Hamilton was surprisingly chipper for a moment, but then a quote. Um, you know, this week has really, I think, caught a lot of people's attention because last season, I don't know if you guys got this sense, but it felt like even with some of the strategy, Lewis wasn't always on board and he was questioning um, reasons to pit and entire, you know, degradation and different things. I always wondered what those conversations regarding around the car were, you know, in debriefs and whatnot. His quote was, I've driven so many cars in my life. I know what a car needs. I know what a car does not need. I think we can all agree there. Uh, I think it's really about accountability. It's about owning up and saying, yeah, you know what? We didn't listen to you. It's not where it needs to be. And we've got work to do. What did you guys make of, of that um, pretty telling quote, I think, calling out his team? It, it was um, it was interesting, wasn't it? Because like you said, he was chipper on the Sunday. And we couldn't quite, I think we mentioned this last week, that no one ever seemed to be kind of aligned in what they were saying at Mercedes. Mm -hmm. Somebody was positive, somebody was negative, somebody was middle of the road. Maybe there was some method to that madness, I don't know. But yeah, it was surprising. And, um, you know, like you said, Katie, it, it picked up traction this week. It's interesting when you look at Lewis as well, because <clears throat> he has such a high level of what he expects from that team, you know, in strategy, in terms of development, just in, in everything. I remember at the start of last season, uh, he was asked a question about, you know, if he's worried the team might have taken a wrong step. Or maybe it was the year before, right? The, I'm pretty sure it was last year, but and his quote was, "My team don't make mistakes," and it was kind of the big quote going into that that test, um, and it shows you that he has that belief. He's like, "No, you know," and and he was always to his credit, he was always very fast. I know people kind of joke, you know, we've got the best fans, the best team, but when he was on that winning run, he was very quick to always point out it's the team. You know, I'm part of this big team that's doing this. And I think he's one of the best drivers for doing that. You know, people sometimes doubt his sincerity, but if you look through his throughout his time at Mercedes, he's been like that. So. When they're in this situation they're in now, I think that him being very, very determined, you know, him, his kind of almost perfectionist attitude comes across as if he's kind of calling the team out publicly. And I think that um, it's interesting because I think it, the way the team responds to it is always, you know, is would always be the key thing. I think Toto Wolf kind of appreciates when people are very, very frank and very very straightforward mm -hmm. they released a public letter as well, didn't they, Mercedes, to their fans, kind of in the in the wake of that, just to say, look, things aren't you know things things are fine kind of manage that a little bit um but yeah it was very interesting and i think i don't I, I don't when i see quotes like that from lewis i think lawrence and i've been f1 long enough to know that lewis you know he's a straight shooter he just says he says things as raw as they are in his head at that point and sometimes they can come across if you're reading them just you know in the cold light of day you look at it and think well he's he's throwing mercedes under the bus here he's calling them out when i think it actually is you know he's he's got that level of expectation he's obviously had doubts about this concept going way back to last year and i think now there's almost a kind of 
you know, I told you so kind of attitude to it. Mm-hmm. And he's almost like, let's now listen to to the drivers, the guy that knows, you know, the guys that know what they're talking about in terms of what a car feels like. Um, and yeah, it was it was on a it was on a um, the quote itself was on a, a podcast. You know, got picked up a bit later after it, after he'd made the comment. But it, again, to go back to what you said um, at, at the top there he said that maybe an hour or so after he was telling everybody yeah everything's fine everything's great so it just shows you you know the right question the right the right microphone in his face at the right time and he'll give you that quote so it's it's really interesting with lewis i've always found that quite fascinating about him he's he's very difficult to read and you're never sure what kind of statement you're going to get and whether it, who who is aimed at if it's aimed at anyone sometimes it's him just saying what what he thinks at that point is a letter to fans commonplace i've not seen one for a long time um, I think, I mean, I don't know, Lawrence might remember better. I think Mercedes have quite a unique relationship with their fan base online. I think them and McLaren have a really engaged fan base, uh, mm-hmm. compared to say Red Bull or even Ferrari. I think Ferrari, you know, maybe they'd do the same thing. I don't know, but Mercedes have this very, very passionate support on social media. Uh, and I think that it's just, they, they, I think they've just been getting so much abuse for the, <laughs> their admins on the social media accounts that run those things. I think they thought, right, we've got to get out ahead of this. But they've, you know, they've, but, but they've done things like that in the past, I think. But maybe I'm missing an obvious example that Lawrence will, will recall, but I can't but, think of anything. Uh, the one that always springs to mind is, is Zach Brown's done a number of letters. Of course, to, yeah. Open letters to fans, uh, not always on McLaren, sometimes on the state of Formula One. Um, mm. And kind of, you know, as a way of directly speaking, to the fan base rather than going through us journalists, you know? Uh, so um, I, I, I think that's sometimes the idea when, when a team believes that the message they're trying to put across is, is being lost in, in translation a little bit through the steps that, you know, these, these quotes sometimes take uh, and they want to set the record straight somewhat. That's, that's a way of doing it. But I was, I mean, I was a bit surprised by Mercedes doing it, you know, after one race and it was almost apologetic in tone, uh, which um, yeah, I, I think is, is a, is unusual for a team after one race, but then again, it shows you how high Mercedes set their expectations and, mm-hmm. and where they want their team to be and where it is right now isn't good enough. So, mm-hmm. um, so I, I think that speaks a lot to to why they put that out there. I think it's, Lawrence, yeah, sorry. I think it's easy to be cynical, like Lawrence says, but um, I actually kind of thought it was quite impressive. You know, they don't. There's this kind of attitude of like, you know, we'll put a letter out. I saw some memes from like, you know, people being like, imagine what Christian Horner and Max Verstappen think reading that. But I was like, well, yeah, but. You know, Mercedes won eight straight championships and then last year won one race. You know, they've come into this season and they're a long way off the pace. So it just shows you, you know, that that, that culture of winning is still ingrained in them. And, you know, they feel this badly about the fact that they've slipped down the order. So, um, yeah, if that's anything, if, if, if you base the rest of the season based on a letter, then maybe there's reasons to be hopeful if you're Mercedes because it, it shows kind of a fighting spirit, right? They're not going to just lie down and, and take it. Okay, to that point, are you expecting Lawrence much of the same from Mercedes this weekend in Jeddah, or could we see possibly anything different from this group? Um, I think it's going to be a, a pretty tough race because if you look to where the Mercedes was good and where it wasn't, one of its main weaknesses at the moment is in is in high-speed corners, and there's quite a lot of those at Jeddah. Um, <laughs> so I'm not expecting them to be right back at the front, but uh, I think in the race they're going to have an easier time because – one of the big issues in in the race in Bahrain was was tire degradation, and uh, if Lewis, uh, if his car had basically been able to manage that a little bit better, if he'd been able to, um, you know, drive around it a bit better with, with the tools he had, essentially with a bit more downforce, then uh, then he might have been able to keep Fernando Alonso behind. So I think um, it probably won't look quite as bad as it did in Bahrain, but I think it's still not necessarily a Mercedes track. I may be proved wrong. We're, you know, we're dealing with such a small sample of data here from Bahrain and various different corners and what the cars look like relative to each other. But, um, but yeah, my, my expectation would be not a massive step here, but there will be other tracks where I think they will have steps. And then um, there's a lot has been made of, of an upgrade coming for Imola. Mm-hmm. Um, that was already in the pipeline before Bahrain so it's not a reaction to the bad result it was already decided that they were going to do this and they made it quite clear that one of the things which everyone's pointing the fingers up which is you know the unusual side pod design they have on that car is going to change in some way it's they said it's not going to be exactly like Red Bulls uh, but it's not going to be like it is right now so uh, it is going to morph into a slightly different shape it seems but Total Wolf has also pointed out don't expect this to to, to, to change the competitive order massively. You know, he was saying, even if we find 0.3 seconds, you know, on qualifying pace, 
based on Bahrain, they're still 0.3 seconds off, which isn't really enough to go fighting for championships. So, um, yeah, that's uh, that's where they are. And um, I, I think really what they're looking at now um, in reaction to Bahrain is is going back to some of the basic car concepts that they looked up before and for whatever reason didn't choose to pursue and trying to understand what they've missed and where Red Bull and Aston Martin have made these massive gains over the winter and and why Mercedes hasn't been able to keep up with that. Uh, so that's uh, that's the stage now. But that process could be much longer. That could be really looking to 2024 before there's a genuine fix on the car just because of what you can change mid-season with a car under the budget cap and with aero testing uh, restrictions as well. Mm-hmm. Oh, interesting. Uh, I want to hit some logistical news, though, really quickly. Um, London, obviously, seems to be vying for a Grand Prix. We'll get to that, Nate. But Formula One announced that the Austrian Grand Prix and F1 have extended their contract until 2027, which I would imagine a lot of fans are extremely excited about. I know the two of you have both been to Austrian Grand Prix, and from my memory, you both really love the event. Is that correct? Yeah, it's mega. It's um, oh it's like a it's like a European mu- music festival, uh, with racing cars going around it, and it's okay. kind of like the what the second or the third Verstappen home race because all the a lot of Dutch fans make it across the border. You know, some some go there, some go to Spa, lots go to Zandvoort. Um, just a great place, and it's just like I mean, people always draw on the sound of music kind of reference when they're writing press releases or they're writing about it but it is exactly like that you know you're driving in this is mountains mountains you know all these lovely austrian houses and and then suddenly you know there's this kind of circuit just kind of almost cut into the mountainside so it's this lovely place and as a bonus for us it's the only media center where you can pretty much see the entire circuit people always when when i tell them about our job you know they assume you're sat at turn one or you know you're sat on the start finish straight but often you're in a room looking at a screen in Austria, you turn to your right. Um, well, obviously, it depends which, which way around you're sitting. But there's a whole. The only bit you can't see actually, unless you're right, right of the wall, is the start finish straight. You can see the rest pretty much, which is always great. And I remember in 2016, uh, Lewis and Rosberg were in that great championship fight they had that year. Mm-hmm. Final lap, Lewis starts off. You saw Rosberg slightly get wide at the first corner, and I, where I was sat, I was watching them going up the hill. And that's when they went wide and they kind of touched. And and then because there's a slight delay on the TV screens, um, I looked back and I saw them, you know, I saw it on TV. So it was like you got like a double hit of it. So, um, yeah, it's, but it's a great it's a great spot. And um, I'm glad it's I'm glad it's staying around. Lawrence, are you glad as well? Or did you just get a visit from the housekeeper? Yeah, housekeeping just came in. Uh, would I like any water? <laughs> Bed turned down. No, we're OK. Thank you. And you said um, no. Uh, well, I mean, I, I thought it was my... <laughs> Might interrupt the podcast slightly. <laughs> I, I just thought you. I just thought you were so bored. He, he of my was a very friendly story. chap. Maybe, maybe we could have gone on <laughs> and uh, and uh, had him contribute. See what he thinks about Ferrari. Um, so where were we? O- Austrian Grand Prix. Uh, mm-hmm. Yeah, brilliant that it's staying on. Absolutely fantastic. Um, I think pretty much agree with, with what Nate says. But it is it is a, a unique venue in F1 in that you just go into the countryside, into the mountains. Uh, it's relatively high altitude as well and have a motor race and the history's there as well. You know, it really does feel like one of the original European races because uh, where the current Red Bull ring is now um, is the old Osterreich ring. And uh, the fact that Red Bull poured so much money into uh, turning that back into a proper racetrack that could host Formula One uh, underlined their commitment to Formula One. And I think the fact that this um, contract's extended again also underlines a commitment uh, to, to Formula One, which is, um, on- which is good news. Based on where we're at with certain contracts, what would you say is the next one, the next Grand Prix that you hope Formula One works with to extend its contract? Silverstone's coming up 2024. That one runs too. Um, Obviously, Monaco is always the the Mm. big question mark. They had that one year added on. And then Spa as well, because Spa was kind of seen as maybe the one that would drop off for for Kyle Army. And people listening will notice there's a trend with those, right? All the European races seem to be like with a big question mark next to them at the moment. So that's a bit concerning. Not all of them, but whenever there's a race in doubt, it seems to be one of those kind of classic venues. So um, I think we spoke before, didn't we, about how I find it interesting that the European races will get a one, two, three-year extension. But then you look at Vegas, you know, they they push for 10 years. You look at the Middle Eastern races, they get 10-year deals. So it mm-hmm. shows you how the balance of power has kind of shifted towards, you know, some of the newer venues coming in and how difficult it is for these smaller venues to, you know, to stay part of it. Well, to that point... 
European races, one actually right in your backyard was circulated or reports were this week that um, a street race, new plans for a London street race around the Docklands area, I believe, which currently hosts a Formula E event, uh, put forward plans that they wanted to possibly host a London Grand Prix in the future. Nate, you've got an article right now on ESPN.com kind of debunking, it seems, yeah. this proposal. Where are we with that? Is Formula One even interested? Well, that's the key que- That's the key part is that it, it seems that the answer to that is no. <laughs> um, mm-hmm. And it's funny in Formula One, I think one of the stories you can guarantee will come up every couple of years is this p- possibility of a London Grand Prix. You know, something that Bernie Eccleston, you know, clearly was interested in exploring, but it, you know, there were talks of, can we get it in central London for people not familiar with London? So it's more in the East. It's, it's kind of, you're pushing towards the area that hosted the Olympics. You know, you're, you're going out towards that, that kind of neck of the woods. Um, and like you said, it hosts a Formula E race. So clearly can host a motor race, but I think Formula One are quite clear that it's not the area. It's not a part of London they'd want to go to. You know, if you look at um, what they've done in Vegas, that's the middle of the city. I think also, I think that, you know, this, I think Formula One were quite annoyed about how that all came out, to be honest, because this the, the company that's put this together is called the London Collective, and their plan is actually quite cool. If you look at it, there's talk of kind of floating grandstands and temporary um, track that can be flipped over and then becomes like a bike and a, a running track when Formula One's not there. It's part of a redevelopment of that whole area. So the, the plan itself looks quite great, but um, I think Formula One felt that they basically just planted this story into the press everyone runs wild with it saying London Grand Prix could be on the calendar and Formula One come out and say, well, no, we haven't, we haven't even spoken to you yet. So I think that that's sadly quite low down on the list of things that are likely to happen. Um, I'd love to see it. I think it would be interesting, maybe not in the Docklands area. Anyone who's lived in London, you know, the Docklands isn't what you think of when you think of, you know, a great London race. I'd love a race down the Mall, down towards Buckingham Palace. But again, anyone who's lived in London will know that just the idea of shutting London down for a few days for an F1 race I mean, it was bad enough when we had the Olympics here. We're a pretty cynical bunch in England, and um, I don't know how they'd do it. But then again, I would never have predicted we'd have a race down the streets in Vegas. So I think the new world of Formula One, maybe things are different. Um, but this plan certainly is a long way away from being green lit. But um, again, it shows you how much interest there is kind of, you know, around the world to put to put events on. I'm going to go out on a limb here from the few days that I've spent in London uh, population per capita in London compared to what you have out in Las Vegas. I, I couldn't imagine the disruption <laughs> yeah. in your yeah. all city compared to what will happen in Vegas. I think they can deal with it. Well, in their I think, area. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right. And I think Vegas kind of, they, they lean into that, right? They lean, lean into like, this is ridiculous. And I think we've said before, if you tried to put an F1 race on in Monte Carlo now from scratch without a race being on, It'd be very difficult to green light that. People would be like, there's absolutely no way we're doing that. It's kind of got the legacy there. So to go into the heart of a very busy city, I think it's very, very difficult to do. Um, and yeah, I can just I can just imagine conversations with my friends down at the pub who don't like Formula One, which is actually a diminishing number now. Every it seems to be fewer and fewer people don't like Formula One. So maybe, maybe this is the time. Strike while the iron's hot and get and get Londoners on board while there's drive to survive out currently. Well, I remember when um, Formula One did a demonstration run in the centre of London, uh, down towards Trafalgar Square, uh, not quite as far as the House of Parliament, but it was just a short run. And uh, one of the things the drivers had to agree to was not to do any burnouts, kind of leave any rubber on on, on, on the uh, tarmac because it might damage the tarmac and all this kind of stuff. It was one of the things that they had to get signed off. And inevitably, their Formula One driver so went and did burnouts and donuts <laughs> and there was burning rubber everywhere. Um, <laughs> but it just goes to show like the the level of restrictions you get in, in a place like London, which, um, yeah, I mean, as, as much as there are, there is a growing fan base uh, in, in the UK at the moment for Formula One, I, I still think there'll be enough people trying to throw spanners in the work and and, and not have it happen. Um, so I think, that, you know, doctrines would be nice, but it does sound to me, you know, we've had this story come up again and again and again, and every time it's really just an attempt to uh, get momentum behind, behind the bid and, and get a bit of cash behind the bid. And then hope that F1 kind of, you know, falls to public pressure and, and has to go with it. But I, yeah, can't see it happening right now. It would be, as you say, Nate, mega if they could yeah. ever get it done. It would be, oh, so well, awesome. So my my my, if if I could draw one up, I would say that the the race starts down the mall facing Buckingham Palace, and you have the king come out on the balcony and he waves the flag to start them. <laughs> they race off, and then he waves the flag to finish it or you know or like prince william does or something can you imagine that'd be amazing never in a million years would it happen but as a visual that would be that'd be pretty pretty amazing 
Keep dreaming. Keep dreaming. <laughs> yeah, that's uh, very much in the in the dream column. Yeah, good. for sure. Before uh, Lawrence's housekeeper comes back for a turn down, let's <laughs> dive into the Saudi Arabian Grand Prix, which is why we're here. Give us a preview, Lawrence, of what storylines you're following. What are you most interested to see and cover over this weekend? Well, it's very much uh, two stories here. There's the sporting side, which um, I'm sure we'll get into, but it's also one year on since there was a missile attack uh, 10 kilometers away from the track on on, on the Friday uh, practice. And, um, you know, that was that very nearly came to a point where the drivers boycotted the race. Uh, over safety concerns um in the end they were taught round to uh to taking part in the race and it went ahead safely um f1 and uh saudi arabia and the fia have uh, bumped up security measures again this year um we're, we're not allowed to talk about exactly uh what's been done but uh but but, but they have made um efforts to make sure that um that everything is a little bit safer and, and there's more precautions in place uh the and without going into global politics it looks less likely that um you know the conflict that resulted in in the missile attack last year um is it there seems to be progress with a ceasefire that was in place until last october but as it, it, it elapsed but it's kind of been extended in that there's been relatively few um issues uh since then so uh that that, that side of it is it, it, still a talking point um as our human rights in saudi arabia um uh, you know that, that that's a very important thing. I think that F1 needs to talk about it, and F1 has said that it it will do so. You know, it's going to countries with the intention to uh, bring about a better, you know, shine a spotlight on on issues in in the countries it goes to. So um, there's still a responsibility there for F1. And then, of course, there is there is a Grand Prix to be held, um, and uh, I think as the second race of the year, and given how dominant Red Bull were in Bahrain, uh, there's a lot of questions that um, are, are hanging in the air as to who's quick, who's not. Is the Aston Martin pace real? Is it not? Um, and at the moment, we're still kind of speculating on this very specific track, you know, based on data that we have from this very specific track in Bahrain. And now we're going to somewhere quite different in Saudi Arabia. So we could get a, a different picture again. Uh, I think most of us are hoping that it's going to be a more competitive one, but we'll just kind of have to wait and see. Well, to one of the things you brought up, I'll turn it to Nate because I feel like he'll like to answer this. Will we see <laughs> consistency from Aston Martin? Could we see another podium? I think it's, it's that's going to, to me, that's the fascinating thing going into the season. I know we've talked about Ferrari, Mercedes and, and Red Bull, but Aston Martin are that kind of joker in the pack now. And I think that what was great about Bahrain was they looked like they had a quick package and then obviously, you know, qualifying, we we're like, okay, is it as quick as it looked? And then in the race, I think with Alonso there behind the wheel, it was really competitive. And obviously they, you know, um, capitalized on Ferrari having their issues. So I think with Alonso, they'll be competitive. It's clearly a very, very quick car. Um, I don't think they'll just take some massive step back. And I think Ferrari and Mercedes are struggling enough that, you know, there's there's kind of, there's room, there's places for them to steal there. So I'd, I'd definitely back Alonso to be up there. Maybe podium. I mean, you know, who knows? You know, like like Lawrence said, if, if Lewis had been able to fight a bit better, if, if Charles Leclerc had finished, he wouldn't have, he would have finished fourth or fifth. But um I'm, as as people know, I'm fully on board the Fernando Alonso hype train. So, um, and I mean, and to be fair, Lance Stroll did very, very well. Um, I actually think that's a really interesting storyline this weekend is with his injuries, how he's going to deal with Saudi. You know, he, he he raced in Bahrain. It was super impressive. He did. But if you look at the Saudi circuit, I mean, that is going to be so taxing on his on his wrists. So, I mean, you know, massive respect that he got in the car and, and raced last week. Um, but I wonder if he'll struggle a bit more this weekend. Um, he's obviously had two weeks to to kind of recover, but it's still it's still pretty taxing. So um, that might hurt Aston Martin in the long run. But yeah, I'd definitely put them in there. That's my very long-winded way of saying yes to your question, yes. Casey. So All right, well, let's get to it. As the host of this podcast, I am protected from ridicule. You are not. Nate currently leads the standings and predictions. One race through, 1-0. Good for you. Uh, need I remind you that Charles Leclerc, who you both had finishing on the podium in Bahrain, will be taking a 10-place grid penalty. Who are you picking to finish on the podium in Jeddah? Do I get to go and first? Actually, did I'm you go Lawrence, first last time? No, I went first. So Lawrence can Lawrence can have you know the, okay. the home the home pick, and I'll take okay. the the visitor pick. Right. Okay. Um, so yeah, I'm going to go really really boring uh, because <laughs> last time I went wild and it didn't work out. So I'm going to say Verstappen, Perez, Science. That is very boring. That is boring. Um, <laughs> yeah. Okay. 
I'm going to go writing, less boring. And I, writing. Sorry, Casey. I'll, okay. I'll let you write. Nate, I'm going to no, go I'm boring and then less boring. So I'm going to go Verstappen because, you, you know, you, we've got to cover our backs with these bets, haven't we? I'm going to say Verstappen signs Alonso. I'm keeping the Alonso hype alive. I think something I'd like to I'd like to think that something we'll see some something that suggests Red Bull aren't completely bulletproof, you know, a reliability issue, something like that. Because I think without it, if 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 the two Red Bulls finish first and second again, you just start to think, you know, are, the, are these two just going to finish one two all year? Um, and I mean, it would be great if it's Verstappen that has that issue because it looks like he's going to dominate the season. But that's my that's my pick. Um, and yeah, I think Alonso is going to be featuring a lot in mine this year. Just in case you guys hadn't worked that out, I'm, I'm, <laughs> <We> <laughs> I'm just going to stick him stick him third as long as I can until he wins a race. We had worked that out. You don't have signs. No, you do. No, I'm sorry. You have Perez in two. Yeah, no, I, I, have say, we, we, I, I have Perez in two, but we might be being a bit harsh on Perez because this is a track where had there not been an early safety car last year, he would have had a really good chance of winning. He True. was very competitive here. Admittedly, it was at a point when Max was struggling with the car relative to Checo, and that doesn't seem to be the case this year. But um, yeah, I'm, I'm going to keep him second for that reason. I think I think Checo uh, could spring a surprise, certainly be closer to Max here than he was in Bahrain. And I said signs second. That's right. You did say yeah. signs. So you don't have Perez finishing on the podium. Okay. No, I think so. I think something will happen to one of the Red Bulls. Um, but Lawrence is right. I think one of the, if you look back at the races that uh, Checo has won, he's very, very strong on street circuits, especially. So, um, yeah. So me not putting him on there is, is actually a bit of a slap in the face. So sorry to Checo and Checo fans if, <laughs> if they're listening. <laughs> All right. Lawrence Verstappen, Perez signs. Nate Verstappen signs Alonso. Yep. There you have it. We will obviously joke, make fun of whoever gets it completely wrong, and we will keep <laughs> our predictions, running list, and record moving on throughout the season. You guys, I appreciate it as always. Thank you so much for the time. Lawrence, enjoy Jetta. Enjoy the coverage. I hope you get a great race. Nate, enjoy some time back in London, and we will see you next week on Unlapped. Cheers. <laughs>